stand up there in the pulpit and you say, I will teach you infinities. I will say to you that the greatest poem in the English language is the present tense of the verb to be. Now, one asks, what is the present tense of the verb to be? Now, I speak for you, right? It's like this. The present predictive of the verb to be. I am. Thou art. She is. He is. We are. Welcome everyone to episode 13 of Conversations with the Wind. I hope everyone is alright and spending their time wisely. Please be safe and creative out there. The song I just played is titled The Ballad of a Sky King by Jack White. Jack wrote this song as a tribute to the 29-year-old ground service operator Richard Russell, who appropriated a Horizon Air Bombardier Dash 8 Q400 airliner from the Seattle Tacoma International Airport and tragically died after crashing on Ketron Island in Puget Sound. Richard Sky King Russell was a man who felt that something was very wrong and sought meaning in an insane world that only marginalized him for being a regular white guy. In a Facebook tribute to Russell, I read the following quote, Heroes get remembered, but legends never die. Rest in peace, Sky King. You can find Jack White's music on his YouTube channel. In this episode, I would like to focus on a different kind of warrior poet with the title, The Heroic Outlaw. Before I begin, I would like to qualify that this episode deals with individuals as opposed to organizations. Therefore, I will not cover criminal organizations like the Italian Mafia, nor will I cover political movements like the IRA. I might try to cover these topics in a separate episode sometime in the future. Legends of highwaymen, robbers, and rogues have been an integral part of the European and white diasporic lore stretching back to antiquity. In some cases, these outlaws served as a lesson to avoid the consequences of living an immoral life. In other instances, these outlaws reflected the zeitgeist of an era and were elevated to mythic status for reasons often not reflective of some of their less scrupulous deeds. 
Nevertheless, the moral code of the outlaw hero remains an intrinsic aspect of their mythology. Not all outlaws and highwaymen are legendary. Some were self-serving brutal thugs whose stories should extol the virtue of their pursuing nemesis. A compelling outlaw must reflect our European biospirit in the sense that even the lawless must possess moral nobility to attain a heroic status within our respective white cultures. We are not thugs, and therefore we do not glorify thuggery. Almost every European and white diasporic culture share numerous folk traditions about the brigands who rose above petty crime to become leaders and advocates for the oppressed. Ned Kelly, Mr. Dick Turpin, Billy the Kid, Jesse James, Matthias Klostermeyer, Shando Ruja, Robin Hood, and a number of other characters can attest to this tradition. Many of these stories and myths were written in poetic verse, often in the form of ballads, which were also reflected in song. There is a wealth of exciting adventure to discover, and I encourage everyone to look into these stories as both a source of contextualizing our current world and as a source of creative inspiration. According to the Marxist Eric Hobsbawm, quote, The point about social bandits is that they are peasant outlaws whom the Lord and state regard as criminals, but who, rem who remain within peasant society and are considered by their people as heroes, as champions, avengers, fighters for justice, perhaps even leaders of liberation, and in any case, as men to be admired, helped, and supported. This relation between the ordinary peasant and the rebel outlaw and robber is what makes social banditry interesting and significant. Social banditry of this kind is one of the most universal social phenomena known to history. Close quote. We must filter out this Marxist deconstruction as it does not fully reflect the core element of a heroic outlaw. These are complex characters, not caricatured social justice warriors or idolized communist revolutionaries. These are men who recognize the need to fight for their people despite their personal ambition, but within the framework of their identity and cultural traditions. Robin Hood fights against an unjust prince, but he does not seek to overthrow the entire nation. In many instances, outlaw heroes can equally represent a reactionary force that rises up against an alien or super. In his book, Outlaw Heroes in Myth and History, Graham Seal discusses the narrative framework of what he calls the Robin Hood Principle. He breaks this framework into 12 distinctive elements. 1. The outlaw hero is forced to defy the law, or what passes for it, by oppressive and unjust forces or interests, usually governments and or local power holders. 2. The outlaw hero has sympathy and support from one or more social groups who form a, quote, resistant community, close quote. 3. The outlaw hero rights wrongs or perhaps settles disputes. 4. The outlaw hero kills only in self-defense or justified retribution rather than wantonly or capriciously and does not attack or harm women or the otherwise vulnerable. 5. The outlaw hero may be kind and courteous to his victims. 6. The outlaw hero redistributes loot among the poor and deserving, and or is otherwise sympathetic to their plight and helpful to their circumstances. 7. The outlaw hero outwits, eludes, and escapes the authorities, usually with some style, often in disguise. 8. The outlaw hero frequently employs some form of magic that confers invulnerability, invisibility, superhuman speed, or another useful attribute. 9. The outlaw hero is brave and strong, or, if not strong, especially skilled in some ability useful to the outlaw life. 10. The outlaw hero is ultimately betrayed by a member of his gang or otherwise supporting social group. 11. The outlaw hero dies bravely and defiantly, whether by rope, axe, sword, or bullet. 12. The outlaw hero may be said to have escaped the showdown, execution, or other manner of death, and to have lived on elsewhere in secure obscurity. In many cases, there are always two sides to every story. Outlaws, who are often portrayed as good, may also have a darker side that requires context and a moral lesson beyond their mythic status. It also makes the character a lot more compelling, as it shows their imperfection, which helps the common man identify with them. The stories of Jesse James and his adventures can provide such an example.
Many could reasonably argue that Jesse James' criminality was a justified action taken because of the injustices both the James and Younger families perceived against the South in the aftermath of the American Civil War. Nevertheless, it is undeniable that Jesse James led a gang that committed violent criminal acts that ultimately led to their downfall. Toward the end of his career, James went back to his home state of Missouri and hired the Ford brothers as bodyguards and new gang members. But the Ford brothers betrayed Jesse James for the bounty offered, so Robert Ford shot an unsuspecting Jesse James in his own home. The ballad, Jesse James, sung by Vernon Dalhart in 1925, described the betrayal by a trusted and close friend. Here is The Ballad of Jesse James. Conversely, The James and Younger Boys, sung by O.C. Cotton Davis in 1941, is a ballad told from Cole Younger's point of view that expresses regret for the gang's crimes. Some argue that Cole Younger felt a stronger commitment to the Confederate cause and regretted his criminal past. In his later life, Cole portrayed himself as a Confederate Avenger more than an outlaw. There are a number of different interpretations which I will leave in the capable hands of honest historians. Here is... The James and Younger Boys. I am a bonded highwayman, Cole Younger is my name. Through a many a temptation, I brought my friends to shame. For the robbing of the Northfield Bank, they say I can't deny. 
And now I am a poor prisoner in the still water jail I lie. Come listen, come Ridge, listen, a story I will tell. Of a California miner on whom my fate befell. We robbed him of his money, boys, and bid him go his way. And that I'll always be sorry of until my dying day. The next thing we defended them off was the Union Pacific Railway. The engineerman and foreman got killed, a conductor escaped alive. And now the poor bodies lies moldering beneath the New Nebraska skies. We started then for Texas, that good old Lone Star State. Out on the New Nebraska prayer is the James boys we did meet. With guns, cards, revolvers, we all sat down to play. And drinking a lot of good whiskey, boys, to pass the time away. We started then northward, and northward we did go to the godforsaken country called Minnesota. Our eyes being fixed on the Northfield Bay, when Brother Bob did say, Coley, off you undertake that job, you'll surely curse the day. We pointed out our pickets up to the bank did go. And there upon the counter we made our fatal blow. Sing, hand us down your money, boys, and make no scarce delays. We are the James and younger boys and spare no time to pray. This was sung by Cotton Davis in the farm workers community at Portersville. The Betyard were highwaymen bandits of 19th century Hungary. They acquired a legendary status as men of the people and enjoyed wide support from the local populations where they often hid when pursued by the authorities. Some were more self-serving while others genuinely helped the poor and even fought in the Hungarian War of Independence of 1848. Sándor Rózsa is the most famous Betyár. He roamed the great Hungarian plain and became a national symbol of resistance against foreign oppression. Other Betyárs included Joska Sobri, Joska Sovanyú, and Márton Vidrucki. Similar to the Western, the Betyár movie became its own style, Talpunk alat fütyula szél, or The Wind Whistles Beneath Our Feet, is a movie considered the most popular of this genre. There's also a Hungarian nationalist organization which has assumed the mantle of these legendary men. The organization is primarily a private sporting club, but they have been known to demonstrate a show of strength when necessary to protect local Hungarians against alien criminal elements. The organization is called the Betyar Shereg, Army of Bandits. Many Betyar folk songs and ballads were written to elevate these romanticized high women to become a part of the warrior poet mythos. Their legend continues to captivate the imagination of Hungarians, especially in nationalist circles. I believe elements of the outlaw hero can easily fit into the expression of the warrior poet, but it would require a deeper understanding of these myths to define which stories represent our values and which stories require more critical review. In some instances, the lawman was right, while in other instances, the outlaw hero deserves our respect. Ideally, an outlaw hero can represent someone who balances his rage and rebellion within the dialectic of artistic violence, only if their actions are consistent with the legend. Without a strict set of moral codes to solidify the demands of heroic mythology, the outlaw hero is just another thug. As we read these stories and review these mythological figures, we are forced to ask ourselves if we are becoming outlaw art artists, or are we always going to remain dissident artists? One thing is clear. We cannot deconstruct and define ourselves along a false message of artificial rebellion. We must always define ourselves along a greater message for our people. While we may draw inspiration from the outlaw hero, 
the outlaw hero, does not define us. I will end this segment with a compilation of Hungarian Betyar outlaw folk songs from Zala County, Hungary, followed by a Betyar song accompanied by flute from the Bukony region of Hungary. <laughs> Fájdalmas a szilagycsikorrugása, 
Sírja, jó anyám, alig az okogása. Bakonyerdő barlangjában Tizenhat markos betyár van Vélem együtt tizenheten Minden zsandár keres engem Kalapom szememre vágom a madár is sír az ágon, híres betyár lesz belőlem, reszket hét vár megyet tőlem. Volt szeretőm kicsi barna, vállára hajlott a haja. Megcsalta a betyár szíve, jaj, de keservesen élek. Tisza partján elaludtam, jaj, de szomorú támódtam, álmaimból felébredtem. Kilenc zsandár állt előttem, zsandár urak mit akarnak, talán vasalni akarnak, nem akarunk mi vasalni, sárga csikót elhajtani. Sárga csikó nem eladó, nem is zsandár alávaló, mert ha arra zsandár ülne, még a madár is rab lenne. Megkérdezték, mi a nevem, Hol az utazó levelem? Várjál, zsandár, megmutatom, Csak a lajbim kigombolom. A lajbimat kigomboltam, Revolverem előhúztam, Kettőt-hármat főbe lőttem, Itt az utazó levelem. Kettőt-hármat főbe lőttem, Itt az utazó levelem. Poets in Our Sphere. In this segment, the first poem is from Barovius, whom I introduced in my previous episode. He sent me a new poem this past week, which he says was inspired by this program, Conversations with the Wind. My goal is to help inspire our brothers and sisters to find ways to creatively express themselves within our collective biospirit. Therefore, I am both grateful and humbled. Thank you, Barovius. Barovius describes this poem as a creation undeniably linked to the ultimate patriotic Hungarian poem Nemzeti Dal, National Song, written by Sándor Petufi. Barovius says, quote, How could it not? How could this poem arise from anything but the Hungarian soul? Close quote. You can find him under Barovius on Twitter. As I mentioned on the last episode, Barovius has written an exquisite collection of poems available on Amazon under the title, quote, Mansions of the Phoenix. Please check it out. Here is The Warrior Worthy of His Blade by Barovius. The Warrior Worthy of His Blade 
Fényesebb a láncnál a kard, jobban ékesíti a kard. The warrior worthy of his blade is himself in fires tempered, his metal on the anvil laid. His senses must be sharper even than the edge of his steel, his fierce judgments yet more thoroughly annealed. Life and death are elementally forged into the blade's hammered layers. In the worthy hand it is fearsome against oathbreakers and betrayers. In cause to liberate or to decimate, strike hard. Destinies ride on the narrow edge of courage and of faith. The heavens will look down with regard when arm and mind is so aligned in purpose set higher than impending fate. Arm flash forward as fire and mind constrain as ice. Let the soul and the scabbard both be fixed with this device. Loose the blade's imperative, hold not back when sound reason or strong warnings no longer suffice. I wrote this next poem as a ballad for a much-needed contemporary man against time, whose very existence threatens these illegitimate artificial usurpers. Always remember that we should never call these people elite, because they're just an inferior facsimile lacking substance. Here is Artificial by Nullis. Artificial. She had no name, no legacy. Her memories were wiped away. Now she's become the peasantry, traditions her parents betrayed. What was once unique and special reveals no meaning, no purpose. Existence is artificial. Her people were bred for service. Breaking souls of the confident, they stole everything that they could, destroying every monument wherever Europa once stood. In this wasteland of arrogance, hidden deep behind sterile doors, a fateful sign of providence, an incredible boy was born. She switched him with an alternate for fear of what they will unearth. She hid him from the surrogates. He was in danger from his birth. This woman's first and only son Smuggled away through a back door, the hive had learned what she had done. The boy's brave mother was no more. He was reared with strict discipline, men who had preserved the old ways. They saw the potential within, the boy grew stronger every day. His childhood had long since passed, the hive has been hunting him down. These weak rulers will be surpassed bringing honor to every town. Enraged by their dispossession, these brave men threw down their collars. Towards valor, with their ascension, their roars raged with every holler. His great legend will fill the void, and does not stop until restored. This evil hive must be destroyed, and it's artificial no more. Now I would like to play a poem read by the famous Australian bush ballad and country singer Stan Coster. The poem was written by Scots-Australian poet William Henry Ogilvy. The poem is titled Outlaw, about the taming of a wild horse, written from the horse's point of view. Although not a poem about an outlaw, it still serves as a beautiful metaphor to the world in which we live today. Incidentally, Coster recited this poem by heart. Here is The Outlaw. Thank you very much. I do you sprung that one on me, Terry. <laughs> you don't believe in doing things in half measures, eh? It's a very long poem. It's, uh, Ogilvy wrote it, putting himself in the uh, mind and eyes of a Brumby stallion. It's called The Outlaw. And this old outlaw said... Our home was the fenceless ranges we fed in the bluegrass swamps. The green of the branching wilga was the roof of our noonday camps. We drank at the pools in the lignum where mist and moonlight meet, stealing like ghosts through the darkness with dew on our shoeless feet. I was chief and warden. I watched while the shy mares fed. I herded the bitless yearlings, those proud wild sons I bred. When a dry twig snapped in the forest or a snake slid out of the grass, 
I called my mob together till I saw the danger pass. For matchless speed and beauty and pride of blood and bone, the bushmen of the border had marked us as their own. All day they planned their stockyards and set their blue gum bars. All night they wrought our capture as they dreamed beneath the stars. They tracked us to our playgrounds. They hid to watch us feed. They matched their weighted whalers against our naked speed. And when we broke and beat them, outwilled them and outran, I was the proud grey stallion that thundered in the van. For long our speed defied them. We met and beat their best, the border's swiftest horses and the picked men of the West. But drought rode down the ranges and drove us worn and weak from out the sheltering mulga to the flats beside the creek. And then, with their corn-fed horses, they chased us frail and afraid and forced us foaming and fretting to the yards that they had made. Within their ten-foot fences and behind their blue gum bars, they held us, kings of freedom, whose fences had been their stars. They broke my mares to harness. They saddled my splendid sons to round the cattle on drafting camps on drought-bound western runs. These they bent to their bidding, but I was aware and awake. They broke my sons to service, but me they could not break. I threw their famous riders one by one as they came, the lean, brown, reckless bushmen who sought my heart to tame. I would not bear their burden, I who had never borne, more than the dust of noonday, more than the winds of morn. And then he came, my master, lissom and iron thighed, lord of the earth's wild horses, riding a sensuous ride. Boldly I battled beneath him, I matched my strength with his own, I was thrown a hundred riders, but he was not born to be thrown. He scored my ribs with green hide, he spurred my flanks till they bled, and he checked my mouth with a bar bit till the foam came back at him red. I fought like a maddened wildcat at the ceaseless sting of the steel. I turned like a tortured tiger snake and bit at his rolled heel. I gave him no easy triumph. Stubborn, I would not yield till my eyes were hot and clouded and my hide was wet and wheeled. But at last my sinews slackened, my proud wild spirit was spent, and I bent to the will of my rider as never before had I bent. And then did he show no mercy, but for every stroke I made, and he struck me again and fiercely with his splendid strength for blade. He spurred me out to the ranges and dripping with blood and foam and wielding and blind and conquered, he flogged me bitterly home. Day after day he rode me, I ceased from the useless fight. I could not face his courage and I could not match his might. But the fire of my heart kept burning and one day as he reached for the girth, I leapt with a scream of fury and struck my foe to the earth. I trotted and trampled him under, I tore his breast with my teeth, my towering weight above him and his quivering flesh beneath. No, I broke to the open ranges. There was none could stop me or stay. No creaking flood could foil me. No fences could bar my way. I tore his trappings from me on the boughs of the Balaar, and naked as I left them, went back to wind and star. The scrubs were gay as ever. The lignum swamped as green. I found the shading Wilga where our noonday camps had been. But the bush was still and lonely. I had neither breed nor bride. And when I whinnied down the ranges, it was only Echo that replied. And then comes a fear upon me, a fear that fills my breast, a racking, ruthless terror that robs me of my rest. A shadow shape that meets me with a wilder shadow stir, the phantom of a horseman who rides with whip and spur. I could not throw him living in my fierceness and my faith, and today I find no courage that will rid me of his wraith. With lean ribs lashed by terror, with flanks that fear makes red, I carry us through the ranges, the unrelenting dead. My flanks are clenched of blood marks, my bit-torn mouth is healed, but again I meet my master, and again he makes me yield. Beneath the moons of midnight and through the morning haze, he flogs me, wet and trembling, down old remembered ways. I feed not in the, in the daytime, at night I take no rest. The sweat is on my shoulders and the foam is on my breast. I bear no bit nor bridle, but beneath the open sky, the ghost of him that rode me shall ride me till I die. <laughs> I will now read a ballad of Robin Hood titled Robin Hood's Chase from the book by Joseph Ritson titled Robin Hood, a collection of all the ancient poems, songs, and ballads now extant relative to that celebrated English outlaw. According to the author, this ballad was from an old black letter copy in the collection of Anthony A. Wood. Here is Robin Hood's Chase. Robin Hood's Chase. Come, you gallants all, to you I do call, 
that now are in this place. For a song I will sing of Henry the king, how he did Robin Hood chase. Queen Catherine she a match did make, as plainly doth appear, for three hundred ton of good red wine, and three hundred ton of beer. But yet her archers she had to seek, with their bows and arrows so good. But her mind it was bent with a good intent, to send for bold Robin Hood. But when bold Robin he came there, Queen Catherine she did say, Thou art welcome, Loxley, said the queen, and all thy yeomen gay. For a match of shooting I have made, and thou on my part must be, if I miss the mark, be it light or dark, then hanged I will be. But when the game came to be played, bold Robin, he then drew nigh, with his mantle of green most brave to be seen, he let his arrows fly. And when the game it ended was, bold Robin went it with a grace, but after the king was angry with him, and vowed he would him chase. What though his pardon granted was, while he with him did stay, but yet the king was vexed at him, when as he was gone his way. Soon after the king from the court did hie, in a furious angry mood, and often inquired both far and near, after bold Robin Hood. But when the king to Nottingham came, bold Robin was in the wood. O oh, come now, said he, and let me see, who can find me bold Robin Hood? But when that bold Robin he did hear, the king had him in chase. Then said little John, "'Tis time to be gone, and go to some other place." And away they went from Merry Sherwood, and into Yorkshire he did hie, and the king did follow, with a hoop and a hollow, but could not come him nigh. Yet jolly Robin he passed along, and went straight to Newcastle town. And there he stayed hours two or three, and then to Barwick is gone. When the king did see how Robin did flee, he was vexed wondrous sore, with a hoop and a holler he vowed to follow, and take him, or never give war. Come now let's away, then cries little John, let any man follow that dare. To Carlisle will hie with our company, and then to Lancaster. From Lancaster then to Chester they went, and so did King Henry. But Robin went away, for he durst not stay, for fear of some treachery. Says Robin, come let us for London go, to see our noble queen's face, it may be she wants our company, which makes the king so us chase. When Robin he came, Queen Catherine before, he fell low upon his knee. If it please your grace, I'm here to this place for to speak with King Henry. Queen Catherine answered bold Robin again, the king is gone to Mary Sherwood. And when he went away, to me he did say, he would go and seek Robin Hood. Then fare you well, my gracious queen, for to Sherwood I will hie apace, for fain would I see what he would with me, if I could but meet with his grace. But when King Henry he came home, full weary and vexed in mind, and that he did hear Robin had been there, he blamed Dame Fortune unkind. Your welcome home, Queen Catherine cried, Henry, my sovereign liege, old Robin Hood the archer good, your person hath been to seek. But when King Henry he did hear that Robin had been there him to seek, this answer he gave, he's a cunning knave, for I have sought him this whole three weeks. A boon, a boon, Queen Catherine cried, I beg it here of your grace, to pardon his life, and not seek strife, and so endeth Robin Hood's chase. Next, um, although not an outlaw theme, I thought it would be fun to share a poem I had written in the spirit of the epic story of Dangdo Durndo. So please enjoy The Legend of Dangdo Durndo. The Legend of Dangdo Durndo This cowboy once lived, if the legends are true, he slept under a sky astoundingly blue. The prairie was vast to cover his great shame, the townsfolk would mock him and gave him a name. This cowboy was young, barely twenty and two, his horse was a brown pinto named Rendezvous. He was quiet and shy, but his heart was strong. When he rode into town, he would hear this song. Dangdo Durndo, if you dare, come on in and grab a chair. Dangdo Durndo in the room, plucking away on a broom. Dangdo Durndo upside down, it will make you lose a frown. Dangdo Durndo all night long, come on boy, just string along. 
The girl's name was Lily. She wore a red dress. Her father had worked for the Pony Express. Her deep blue eyes sparkled in the morning light. She was a big girl with a large appetite. The cowboy had seen her work at the saloon. She was feisty and loud and used a spittoon. To impress her, the cowboy grabbed the big broom, played it like a guitar, and filled the whole room. Dangdo Durndo, if you dare, come on in and grab a chair. Dangdo Durndo in the room, plucking away on a broom. Dangdo Durndo upside down, it will make you lose a frown. Dangdo Durndo all night long, come on boy, just string along. The cowboy can't sing, but he tried really hard. He pranced around the room like some fancy bard. The broom made no sound, but that didn't matter. Wherever he turned, the people would scatter. The cowboy jumped onto a big chandelier. Lily was laughing as she was serving beer. The cowboy flipped over to throw her a kiss. The ceiling had cracked, and it sounded like this. Dangdo Durndo, if you dare, come on in and grab a chair. Dangdo Durndo in the room, plucking away on a broom. Dangdo Durndo upside down, it will make you lose a frown. Dangdo Durndo all night long, come on boy, just string along. The cowboy had landed into the spittoon, tobacco was flying all over the room. Lily was covered in soft, sticky drool, the cowboy ran away and felt like a fool. The moral of the story for those still here, never play a broom on a big chandelier. When loving a woman, you always take heed, avoid a big spittoon before you proceed. Finally, I will complete this segment with the following song written by Levanta Nemesh, with the Hungarian outlaw Betyar theme in mind. Here is Mikor Megyek Hozafeli, When I Go Home. Mikor Megyek Hozafeli, kinyit az ég három felé, Az ég nyílik három felé, mert én megyek hazafelé. Felsütött a napsugára minden ember ablakára. Ja Istenem, mi az oka, az enyémre nem süt soha. Ja Istenem, mi az oka, az enyémre nem süt soha. Talán meg vagyok átkozva, az Istentől szomorítva, vaj apámtól, vaj anyámtól, vaj a legelső babámtól. Vaj apámtól, vaj anyámtól, vaj a legelső babámtól. Babám, babám, kedves babám, több átkod neki állts helyám, Olyan hátok alatt vagyok, az idegen földön vagyok. Olyan hátok alatt vagyok, az idegen földön vagyok. Földön a hazám, minden ember édesapám, minden ember édesapám, minden asszony édesanyám. Minden ember édesapám, minden asszony édesanyám. Idegenek, idegenek, ne egyetek engemet meg, idegenek, idegenek. Adjátok, hogy én is kérjük. Idegenek, idegenek, Adjátok, hogy én is kérjük. Mert én onnan való vagyok, Onnan az a csillag ragyog. Mert én onnan való vagyok, Onnan az a csillag ragyog. Mert én onnan való vagyok, Onnan az a csillag vagyok.
So, in the next segment, I'm honored to have Fernal and Hansen Hollers as my special guest for this week's conversation. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, hello, gentlemen. It's great to have you on the show. Uh, could you please tell us a bit about yourselves for those who may not be familiar with your work and background? Also, please let the audience know where they may be able to find you. Uh, let's start with you, Fernal. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, I'm Fernal. I make music. Uh, I release music on YouTube and SoundCloud. I also have a, a uh, music show that's kind of like a music slash skits, comedy skits show uh, called White Rock Hour. Uh, I probably spend more, more time making that than I do any of the music <laughs> it's like i have started something and now yeah it takes up a lot of my free time but it's super fun so that's, and that's where me. can they find you you have a website or on twitter yeah i'm for null usa on twitter and i believe my d live is just uh for null slash for null Right, I'm right. I'm always either for null or for null usa on all the different places excellent thank you handsome horse could you also give us a little background and uh where people can find you sure thing i'm the handsome horse and i'm the male half of the mamas and the pepes and i have a gab account and the i'm what am i oh i'm at diomedes at gab and i think i have a, a twitter but i don't really follow it if you want to catch what we do, we're over at, we have a website, it's at mamaspepes.com, and uh, Mama P uh, mans the, uh, the, social, the social network accounts. She's Mama Pepes at, well, Twitter, let's say on, on Twitter, she's at Mama's Pepes, and on Gab, she's at Mama's Pepes. Excellent. So let's, uh, op let me open this segment with the general theme of the heroic outlaw. And I'm going to kick off this conversation just by reading out all the questions, and then we could just jump right into the conversation. So the first question is, what do you think makes an outlaw into a hero? The second is, what's your favorite outlaw hero, or who's your favorite, uh, favorite outlaw hero? And did any of these legends influence, uh, you, provide you influence on your worldview? If so, then please tell us more about that legend. Number three, which is more compelling, the outlaw hero or the chivalric hero? Would you consider an outlaw hero a warrior poet of sorts? Number four, was Robin Hood a hero or a villain? And when does it become acceptable to break the law? Number five, do outlaw heroes truly exist? Or do you feel that they're just mythologized tropes? How would you react if these heroes truly existed? And the last question is, do you have any poems, ballads, or songs that you would like to read for the audience? And I'll leave that for the end. So let's just kick this off. Um, let's start with you, Fernal. What do you think makes an outlaw into a hero? Well, what makes them? I, I think they're already a hero. Um, I think what makes them an outlaw is that whoever has power, whoever has uh, the authority to arrest people and point guns at people, uh, you know, they they have the power to call you an outlaw. So, yeah, that's that's what I think. Uh, I think they must already be heroic. I mean, I guess you could have an outlaw who, like, saw too much or something, and then they, you know, they decided to change their ways, and since they had already gone against the grain long enough or they were tough or whatever, they could... They could turn it around and maybe maybe they had guilt or something and decide to make up for it and yeah, you know. like, like the anti hero becoming you know having this redemption story or a redemption arc, I guess you know where they realize something and they're sort of an unwilling hero, and then ultimately they become the hero of the story um, exactly and uh, handsome horse, what about you? What do you think about this uh well, let's see what. What makes an outlaw into a hero? Mm -hmm. I think an outlaw becomes a hero when the law is Ill illegitimate. Mm -hmm. So the outlaws, I mean, I think your, your archetypal outlaw hero is somebody who's not, who's not just an outlaw. They're not a criminal. They're not a common criminal. They're put into the position of being an outlaw 
because the law is illegitimate, the government's illegitimate, or like otherwise the authority is oppressive in some fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, so, it, and ultimately the outlaw hero, and if we're taking sort of Robin Hood as the archetype, he's really the immune system of, of the hierarchy. He's the, he's in some way, it, what he does actually supports the actual, uh, he actually supports the government in a way. So if the, I mean, not to jump, jump ahead and talk about Robin Hood too much, but, um, but realistically, let's say the outlaw hero rolls into town, confronts and beats or, and defeats whoever the illegitimate authority is. And then he returns the governing power over to, uh, the legitimate authority once everything is set to rights. Right. He's not concerned with day-to-day -day governance. He's not like he himself is not the law. He's really just a uh, a curative. He's a, a a hero by situation. And uh, you know, once he's once that's done, he rides off into the sunset. So I think that's the. Uh, so if the question is what makes an outlaw into a hero, I think that's uh, that's it. Is your uh, they can be a common person, but otherwise it's a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a situation when there's tyranny or something that's uh, really unfair. I mean, it might be a little bit of a fantasy, but it's, uh, but that's generally, I think the, uh, what I take as the power as the paradigm. Yeah. So in a sense, the outlaw hero could in some instances be a reactionary hero actually. In a way. Well, I think they're all reactionary heroes, right? Well, that's that's the question, right? I mean, that's that's what I'm trying to think. Even Jesse James is looking to restore the old order, and he's fighting against the new order in a sense. So, I mean, you know, one can argue that there are layers and, and, and different levels of, of criminality involved in each of these different uh, characters. But I would say that in almost every instance, they're looking to uh, fight and bring back, restore some kind of order that existed prior to that. Yeah, and and for that matter, I think the I don't know if you were going this way, but the idea of an outlaw hero seems like a very Western idea, mm -hmm. and and by Western I mean like European, yes, uh, and possibly even just uh, really American. I mean, I realize uh, Robin Hood's uh, English, but uh, the le the lens that you know, so I understand that rebel dynamic from is a very American one. And I, and I guess I started thinking about Westerns. You know, you think about the, you know, uh, pro, you know possibly Billy the Kid, but I think he, well, I think Billy the Kid was really just a murderer. But, right. um, but you know, the, the general idea is, is that's how these people come, become mythologized for uh, pulling one over and perhaps bringing on some level through their being, by being outlaws, they're actually bringing some level of civilization or civilization's ideals to this untamed um Unta the untamed frontier. Right. Well, I mean, I mean I, that was a, yeah. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was just. I'm saying that's the premise of of uh, uh, American westerns generally. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think that that matches. I, and it's interesting because I that's why I brought up the uh, the Hungarian outlaw as a as a contrast to the Western outlaw uh, or the outlaw hero uh, because I do see a lot of similarities, but the uh, foundational uh, motivation is much different for each. So for the Hungarian, it's more a representation of independence, fighting for restoration of, of their independence um, as, a, as a nation almost. So it becomes a more nationalistic symbol. And in the United States, I think the Western represents more of a pioneering spirit, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I think it does make sense. I lost, your, I lost you in my uh, headphones a little bit. But I think what you just said is that the uh, – right, the, the – the, American one is more of a pioneer spirit mm -hmm. and uh yeah and the more like you could say the European is more of a nationalistic kind of uh representation of the Oh uh, I gotcha. Right? Yeah, yeah, I, I see that. I can see that. And America being um you know more than a nation. Mm -hmm. Like it's not really a nation. I mean I realize that we we say we are but we're a bunch of different I suppose the answer is we're we're really a bunch of British colonists. Right. And uh, grew into a bunch of different nations that somehow came together into one, um, I don't know, you know, one political group. And now we're whatever we are. Right. Um, so. So, yeah, no, I, I totally see that. I mean, I, I, I suppose it was also as Americans, we're also we're also we're also sold a bill of goods about being uh, rugged individuals. Right. 
Right. And that, that fits in with the whole Western cowboy trope, the whole pioneering spirit that, that happened generations before us. And I think we're a lot softer than those uh, ancestors were. And um, But maybe you could say, arguably, that someone like Jesse James is also more of a nationalistic hero as opposed to a, uh, a pioneering spirit. He's more of a, uh, um, a Southern nationalist, you could say, even Cole Younger. Uh, for, you know, he, he even emphasized that he was more of a, a Southern nationalist, a Southern Avenger, so to speak, or a Confederate Avenger than a criminal. So I think that in, in some instances, you could say in the United States that you have certain outlaws who do represent nationalism. Uh, but I think for the most, especially in the Western, the, the quote unquote Wild West uh, theme, the outlaws over there or the outlaw heroes there are more pioneering and more individualistic. Um, I think we should go to the next question. And for now, I'm going to ask you, who's your favorite outlaw hero? Uh, well, I mean, I do like the Robin Hood story is pretty awesome, um, you know, because he's helping out the underdog and he's got a big group of awesome people that he hangs out with. So who help him? And so, so you know, there's just so, so many great stories around Robin Hood. Um, but I also like uh, Clint Eastwood movies, you know, the Spaghetti Westerns. I, I, I love that, too, you know, where you got this rough guy, you know, he doesn't really say much, and he's probably on the wrong side of the law a lot of times. But in the end, you know, he's always uh, fighting for righteousness, and, you know, he may not always <laughs> follow the cleanest path, but he ends up in the end and uh, you know, doing the right thing. And I, I always love those movies and, you know, just the story behind them. And, and did any of these uh, outlaw legends influence you on your worldview or how you see the world? Uh, hard to say. I mean, I, I do, I, since I was in high school or whatever, you know, a young kid, um, I'd often fight, you know, for the underdog and would uh you know hang out with the the less popular kids even though i was more popular i so in a way like that those kinds of things like those kind of, is it a virtue i don't know but you know those types of things i guess would be influenced by uh, more of like the outlaw hero type yeah that makes sense and uh and Handsome Horse, uh, what about you? What's your take on the uh, on your favorite outlaw hero? Well, actually, I think all the heroes that I actually like are outlaw heroes. I'm not sure I actually like any straight-up heroes. Uh, and I, that might just be because my, my whole world view is through that uh, sort of American Western lens. So, uh, okay, so for example, I grew up, you know, I, when I grew up in the 80s, uh, there was a TV show called The A-Team. And they were falsely accused of a crime that they didn't commit. Yep. And so they wandered every week. They were pursued by, you know, pursued by the authorities and they would get together and there's, you know, they'd roll into town and usually there's some sort of problem there. And uh, they used their skills at violence because they were all Vietnam vets and they would solve the local problems with the violence and uh, they would beat it, put things to right and then have to leave. So so I really like the A-team, but I also li really like the Incredible Hulk. Because if you remember, uh, the Incredible Hulk was pursued by an investigative reporter. So David Banner, because uh, he was David Banner for some reason in that series, not Bruce. Yeah. And he would roll into town and there'd be some sort of local trouble that could only be fixed ultimately through violence. So he would turn into the Hulk and uh, then he would fix it. Then he turned back into David Banner and he would have to hightail that out of town because that investigative reporter was hot on his tail. And if anybody remembers Knight Rider, yeah. yeah, David Knight had to uh, was a man without an identity, and he was a man who didn't exist. And he had that computerized car, and every week he had to roll into town, and he had to commit some kind of violence to solve whatever the problem was locally. And then he would roll out, and uh, you wouldn't see him again. I'm sorry, Michael Knight. Uh, Mama's Peppies is correcting me. It's actually Michael <laughs> Knight, and the car's name is Kit. Yeah, I know that everybody knows the car's name's Kit. <laughs> And, uh, you know, actually, and circling this back to the uh, Spaghetti Westerns, you might remember there was a TV show called The Master starring Lee Van Cleef. Yeah. He was the actor who played Angel Eyes in The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. 
he also played uh, Colonel Mortimer in A Few Dollars More, and he he was one of the gang in um, Liberty Valance's gang in uh, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. Yep. Well, anyway, so he played the master, and it was kind of corny because the master was the premise was he was uh, you know he was an Occidental guy, so he was a European. Yeah, the master. Luke Luke Mason knows about the master, and it was it only ran for a couple of seasons, and somehow he was a ninja. And, uh, of course, you know, the premise was every week, you know, he had to do some sign of violence, fix the problem, and then hightail it out of town. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, which was, oh, wait, wait, there's more. We can go on. There's oh, more. Oh, by all means. By all means. Well, anyway, so this is a lot like uh, if, you, if you were <laughs> Kung Fu, David Carradine. Exactly. You know, yeah. he, wa- he walked the earth, you remember, and every week, you know, it was uh, some kind of fight, and uh, he had to hightail it out of there. So, um you know, so as it happens, yeah. Anyway, so there's anyway, but I, I'm sure I could go on oh, because then it goes. Don't you forget know, the, the Punisher. Shows. Yeah. Oh, the Punisher. Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Uh, well, the Punisher. Yeah, the Punisher. Yeah, right. That he was a he was an outlaw hero too. Yeah. Um. Oh, anyway, what's the next question? Well, I was actually I thought about the uh, the Magnificent Seven, for example, or the Seven Samurai. You know, also oh, sure. excellent movie. Mm-hmm. And 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 what's interesting is that this all the westerns. If you if you watch these old westerns at the end of the episode or the end of the movie the cowboy always leaves and he always goes somewhere else it's it, he never rides stays. off into the sunset correct <laughs> yeah so that's interesting and what i wanted to ask you is out of all of these different influences uh did did any of them have a lasting influence on your world view and if so what was that influence well i think all of them cumulatively had a uh an influence on my world view and it's a bit of a uh it's kind of a stilted worldview. It's because I still have this impression that if I roll into town and I and I finally beat the final boss, uh, all of my problems will be solved. And it turns out that that's not actually not how life works. But it sounds that's nice. The beginning of the pro- new problems. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Like even at the end of the Odyssey, after after Odysseus kills all of the, the young nobility on Ithaca and runs off to the uh, the olive grove where his dad is. And um, finally, you know, it's going to be Telemachus, Odysseus, and Laertes against all of the surviving men of Ithaca. And it takes uh, Athena to come down and say, no, 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 fighting's over to, uh, you know, to stop it. Uh, yeah, that's not life. <laughs> yeah. That's, and, um, and so let's move to the next question. Um, now, this is an interesting one, right? Because... I, I personally think that the the outlaw hero is a chivalric hero in a sense, and so you know it's not as maybe perhaps not as overt and it's not as uh, um, you know he's not he's mostly an antihero he's not the good guy necessarily, and the chivalric hero usually is this knight who's a very uh, um, obvious good guy. Um, do you think that there's a difference between the two, and which one would you say is more compelling? between the two so the outlaw hero or the chivalric hero i'll leave it open to either one of you well i would think that the chivalric uh chivalric it's like saying shiv and elric together right okay yeah the chivalric <laughs> uh <laughs> you know he he's hiding something you know because you can't just be total lawful good all the time and there's not some darker thing underneath so i think the chivalric hero is maybe he's a psycho killer and when no one's looking <laughs> <laughs> well it's like the marshal in the in the uh in the westerns too the same thing you know is the marshal the good guy or is he not the good guy and there are marshals in some stories and in some films that are the good guys but not always so Wyatt, Wyatt Earp is an That's interesting true. one. He's uh he has a dark past, but he's actually the he's the law. But then again, he's kind of not the law, which is very actually Wyatt Earp is a very interesting character. Yeah, I don't know a lot about Wyatt Earp, but that sounds interesting, like sort of a crossover right. uh, type of hero. Well, I think I, well, I, I guess we need a. I, I feel like I need a, a little bit of a definition on what a chivalric uh, chivalric hero is because well so chivalry is a uh system of say mutual obligations between 
and and that that assumes a hierarchy and a relationship between people. So you had these nobles who you're going to be a uh, you you are bound by the duties of chivalry. So I suppose it means that you uh, you save damsels in distress. Uh, damsels permit themselves to be saved. Uh, there's it's a sort of a, a protocol for for fighting, and. Um, mm-hmm. You know, right, you're part of an order. Like, there's sort of, uh, some of these decisions are made for you. Mm-hmm. That is, is that, like, you, there's a, pa- there's probably a, uh, probably a booklet that tells you what to do in every situation that you're going to come across, right? I mean, that's, that's what I picture when I figure a chivalric hero. And that's, um, is it compelling? I think it's compelling. It can be compelling, of course, I suppose, with the, uh, like the Arthur legends, mm-hmm. where they're put, you know, each one of those each one of those guys is put in a situation that's sort of outside the playbook. And, uh, you know, how do you, what, what, what are the, what are your responsibilities? What are your duties? Uh, now I don't know, I don't know the Arthur legends as well as I, I might. Uh, but I do know that there's, uh, like, you know, Sir Gawain, they're all tested in their own sort of way. Now, Heck of Gab says chivalry, lawful goods, like Sir Lancelot of the round table, he'd never do wrong. That's what I'm thinking. Right. Like, uh, typically, you know, there, but, but it, it is like you said. There's like a code of honor, you know, and they're earning that honor amongst their brotherhood. The uh, like, you know, so there probably is like a little pamphlet they all read, and they just walk around following the pamphlet. Whereas the outlaw hero, I mean, it's way sexier. So, you know, it on the surface it seems way more compelling to me, but at the same time. What's that other guy doing when we're not looking? Because I suppose, well, <laughs> right. Well, but I suppose like the answer is, is like the chivalric hero we have in mind is Superman mm-hmm. and like the, the, the sort of the corny straight man, Superman, mm-hmm. you know, the, uh, the, the Superman, you know, the, the Superman who, you know, really nothing, nothing took him down, but say kryptonite. And it was really, you know, really goofy, but otherwise he's totally omnipotent and he's always, you know, you know, standing up for what's right and good. And it's uh, yeah. it's pretty one one dimensional, right? It does feel one dimensional. Like it feels like maybe he has emotional problems, but there's really not there's really not a threat to him. Well, you know, you bring up an interesting point, and I think this is where I see kind of the difference, at least in the understanding of these different character types. Um, the you know the outlaw hero has an internal conflict that they have to overcome to become the hero. And the external pressures are basically uh, pushing against his internal uh, um, conflict. Whereas you have the chivalric hero who often works in a group, but is, is actually being challenged. So their values are being challenged, essentially. And, and the compelling story, I think, for the chivalric hero is more how they can confront external forces with or external pressures and how they can then handle and deal with that. So um, they're being pushed against, their their values are being pushed hard as opposed to the internal struggle from some external force. I think mm-hmm, that, right. that to me would be a big difference between the two. And I think that if you, if you um, formulate a story, like my, my biggest problem in a lot of uh, storytelling today, at least that I see that there's an overemphasis on the internal struggle and they try to make these characters as, as, as bad and as immoral as possible. And I understand the reasoning because they want to have a higher redemption arc. Because then if they can overcome these, these flaws, then they can they become an, an even more compelling hero. But at the same time, I think that we should also start looking at those heroes that receive an external pressure who are otherwise morally very solid and and they're they're confronting a sea of of, uh, of of let's just say degeneracy for argument's sake, and they're standing against it in spite of all the pressures that they're getting. And I think there's also a heroic value to that, and a compelling uh, heroic value to that. So that's where I see the difference. I think both are very good, but I think they have a much different uh, um, conflict. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. So yeah, the chivalric hero will avoid killing the enemy as a solution often too whereas the you know the outlaw hero is more like a punisher or something he's gonna he's just gonna find the bad guy's base and tear through it 
you know, and <laughs> kill everybody he can. <laughs> so the 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 struggle is really him against his own demons. I'm right. just kind of summarizing what you said in my own words, thinking about it. And the chivalric hero is fighting to be righteous, like totally pristine, and still fight it. You know, fight the evil. Yeah, and and you can still be flawed if you're righteous, and that's and I think that's an also an interesting kind of uh, uh, position to take because you can, you know, you can go, you can take your, you know, you have these demons, and you can let these demons consume you, or you can overcome these demons, or conversely, you can be a righteous person, but then you lose sight of what your goal is because of your righteousness. So there's there's interesting. Uh, interesting paths for both of these types of heroes, I think. So, so would you consider an outlaw hero a warrior poet by any chance? Either one of you. Remind us what a warrior poet is. Well, I I use that as a term. In, in I I sort of uh, uh, want to focus that in the the balance between the violence and the rage that one feels and embracing that violence but also tempering it with the moral code and tempering it with, with uh, discipline. So, so you're not really a berserker. You're not going nuts and, and just randomly attacking everyone, but you do have a code. You do have a, a set of values that you live by, and that balances out all the anger, all the rage, and all the violence that you feel inside. And that culminates essentially into this warrior, warrior poet theme that I'm writing about in the... Uh, in the Imperium Art essay, which, by the way, Handsome Horse, we will discuss on another topic in what two weeks, I think. So uh, yeah, <laughs> so so everyone, stay tuned. But anyway, so that's really what I mean by warrior poet is the person who can balance basically both of these sides and embrace the full emotional spectrum at the same time. And do you think right. uh, um, like uh, an outlaw hero has that capability, or is that would you say that an outlaw hero can present themselves that way? Well, I would say, like, to answer that question the way it's asked, I'd say yes. And, I mean, I suppose I could point to uh, Mal Reynolds from um, Firefly. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I think it's in the first episode or so. There's a, uh, of, of the Firefly series, there's a whole, uh, he has a bit of a monologue where he talks about how he's not going to shoot one of the characters in the back. Where if, uh, you know, if I'm going to shoot your boy, it would be in the front and you'd see it coming and you'd know why. You know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so... I think that's, but that seems a kind of a pat answer. I suppose, I suppose the way I would answer this is to argue a little bit with the definition or the usage of a uh, warrior poet, mm -hmm. because throwing it into a, uh, throwing it into a search engine, it seemed like it came up with the idea that a warrior poet actually, you know, there's no poet, there's no literal poetry or actually, hold on. In the case of maybe perhaps Aeschylus, the uh, ancient Greek, there is some poetry, right? But uh, it's not a, a warrior poet isn't a, a poet per se. It's a warrior who is a philosopher right. who actually thinks things through and has a uh, it, and it functionally is a professional, you know, at this. So I'm thinking of uh, Sun Tzu, uh, Thucydides, mm -hmm. uh, von Clausewitz, Rommel, Patton, um, probably any of the, uh, the 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 Confederate generals that are uh, appreciated. And they're not right. They're not poets they're fighters who wrote stuff down mm -hmm. so um you know and uh i guess to you know hit on aeschylus again uh, he's probably you know he's an example uh, i don't actually know does even i don't know if he fits into that warrior poet he happens to be he was a you know he was a warrior general who ended up then becoming a playwright so i, I don't know that he actually fits the uh you know fits that um definition right well, when so, I when I wrote about warrior poet, I didn't literally mean a poet. Although a poet can be a warrior, it doesn't exclude that. But I think that the the intention is for us as artists to embrace this mentality, and that's really more, I think, the point I wanted to, to uh, bring across. Yeah. Well, so I, mean, I think the answer is yes. I mean, so I think you know. So I think the answer is yes. I don't have a really clear. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a clear yes or no, up or down on it. Oh, hey, did you switch something? Because the echo went away. No, I didn't. Um... Oh, wait, the echo's back. There it is. Okay. Oh. So uh, the, uh, yeah, uh, where am I going with this? Oh, hey, uh, Vaclav Havel, does he count? Well, technically, if you want to look at it that way, yes. I mean, he, he is 
essentially his war was waged politically, if you want to put it that way. And then you also have a number of 19th century nationalist poets that were not just writing, but they stood in front of everybody. They uh, recited their poems in front of everybody. Um, the poet I mentioned earlier that inspired Barovius's poem, uh, Shandor Petrofi, the Hungarian poet, he actually fought in various battles. So you do have these characters out there. You do have literal warrior poets out there. Tiratus is a good example as well from Sparta, ancient Sparta. Mm -hmm. So, so they, they do exist. But I think the main, main idea of a warrior poet, at least in the context that I'm trying to convey, is that we embrace the full spectrum of our, um, of our emotion and, and we balance it out with discipline. And we use the elements of what I was referring to earlier in the essay of, of cognitive dominance, which is a military term and a medical term of being situationally aware and keeping our cool no matter how stressful the, situ the world around us is. Um, so, Fornal, did you want to add anything to this? Uh, no, I mean, I think that a warrior poet could be uh, an outlaw hero. I think they could be the chivalric hero. So, um, it, when I read it on because I had to look it up too, and it's basically, you know, a fighter who thinks. So you would think, you know, you got some, some heroes who are just kind of like meatheads, you know, like the Tick or something like that, and they're just, <laughs> you know, blindly fighting and not really caring or thinking about that much. You know, they're going to go eat a ham sandwich afterwards, and they're, they're not going to think about it until the next thing comes along, and then you got, you know, someone who's just going to brood and, or people plan whatever. So I think it I think it kind of works on both sides. But stereotypically, you would think of the uh, you know the outlaw hero as more of the warrior poet type, at least in my mind. Okay. And um, did you want to add anything, Handsome Horse? Uh, I know that. Uh, okay, I know that Uberfolk had a song called "The Warrior Poet." Yes. And it seems like they're using the phrase, you know, from the from the lyrics, it looks like they're using the phrase to mean a poet or a, a thinker who rises to the mantle of a warrior slash leader. And, uh, you know, it, which is, you know, which is not the usual meaning you see on the uh, on the Internet. And that's what made me think of Vaclav Havel, as far as you have somebody who's in the arts or otherwise uh, a thinker who then ends up being a dissident and who ends up you know, through sheer force of will and organization and otherwise being in tune with the, uh, the spirit of the people ends up being a leader. That's correct. Yeah. And, and there was, um, in, in Hungary too, there was a playwright, his name was Istvan Churko, who was a playwright for many years, a very well-known playwright. And he, he also took up the mantle of politics. Um, he was a, a very strong nationalist already in the early nineties. So you, you do have these characters, I think, but I think above all, you know, the warrior poet can encompass many different things. I think that for us as artists, we should embrace all these ideas of thinking, being situationally aware, embracing our full emotional spectrum, not being not not hiding anything about who we are, but expressing it in a way that shows discipline and that shows measured uh, approach. But that doesn't mean necessarily that we're holding back, if that makes any sense. It does make sense. Or at least it makes sense to me, and I think part of the uh, one of one of the harder things to do is sort of right, to unify your your or rather synthesize your aggress your aggression right. and your um you know your 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 impulses for aggression and impulse you know and uh, synthesize that into your your personality so that you actually has a place for it and there's a there's a there's a way to actually you know navigate the world with, uh, you know, possibly violence, but at least with uh, some sort of confrontation, to handle confrontations exactly. so that the, the cognitive dominance aspect of it, of being cool under pressure, is, is really just a way to negotiate the world. Exactly. Because you can't be, you know, you can't be just experiencing pleasure all the time. You're not always just going to be, you know, kicking back with uh, not a care in the world. There's, there's lots of stress. And... Uh, at least, at least right now, it's not something we're taught, or it seems like it's something that you're just sort of thrown to the, you know, thrown out there to just sort of figure it out for yourself. Mm -hmm. But how to actually, you know, how to actually uh, bring it all together, 
you know, because you can't just be, I suppose, well, hold on. I mean, I suppose, wait, wait, there's the, uh, the, the, the Star Trek episode where I think it's mirror, mirror, where they, uh, where, where they split, um, uh, uh, Captain Kirk's personality into two actual separate beings. And there's the good Kirk and the evil Kirk and the good Kirk can't get it actually turns out seems all nice, but he can't get anything done. Mm-hmm. Is that the right episode? Am I thinking the right one? Well, isn't, I, I think that was the alternate universe, but I'm not a huge Trek, uh, person i mean i know some of it but uh, well, i think that was episode 237 but i don't know anything <laughs> about Star Trek. i i i sense you're mocking me no. <laughs> i just played around against <laughs> nullis <laughs> there we go of course no but i i get your point you can't have somebody who's absolute good because they can't really do anything and then you can't well, because have you some- can't eat Right, you don't have a spine. It ultimately is because you're going to fold. Right. There's not a there there. You know, there's not a, uh, there's not something to, uh, you know, uh, press against. There's nothing, you know, and uh, that's something that is is under underappreciated these days. Yes, yes, and I think that the the whole message today of uh, following your own passions is a misleading message because it, it just basically is leading to to lust and that's all you want to pursue or well that's what the message you know suggests that people should just pursue lust and, and enjoyment and pleasure and um, there's no there's no level of responsibility sacrifice or anything of that nature and I think that that's the element that's really missing today at least culturally for a lot of people um, so I just wanted to jump to the next question because I think this one's really interesting. Um, so was Robin Hood a hero or a villain? And this ties into the next one is when does it become acceptable to break the law? And so, uh, for Null, if you, uh, can give me your thoughts on this one. Okay. Well, uh, yes, he is, I guess. Yes, uh, depending on the perspective, uh, if you're a good person, he's definitely the hero. Um, you know, when I <laughs> I've thought about Robin Hood before, you know, if he's robbing a rich person who's good, then that's kind of a villainous thing to do because there could have been some rich people who um, weren't bad necessarily, and so it, you know, maybe the lore. Uh, some people have written it where he thinks about that and he's not just robbing whoever has the money, you know, because, I mean, a robbery could turn into a murder pretty easily if they defend themselves. So that that could be kind of villainous, but maybe that's not in the original Robin Hood story. Maybe maybe they worded it different, so it avoided that situation. I don't know. Maybe it's only robbing the sheriff. Um and then what was the other part? You said one went into the other. The, uh, well, when uh, is it? What did you say? When, when is it? When is it? Uh, when does it become acceptable to break? Oh, the oh, oh. Yeah. So, I mean, when the law is being, I mean, there's laws. There's so many laws, and I'm sure it's always been this way, where whoever is enforcing the law, who has the authority, they can get you on anything. They can just say, this is the charge. And then just ram it through and you're in prison for 400 years. I mean, they can do that. So, you know, is that really law? You know, that's just kind of tyranny. And, uh, I, you know, if you have the (laughs) way to get away with it and you can can do the right thing and truly be a hero, um, then go for it. I mean, I guess the system would say you're breaking the law, but... Uh, I think normal people who who want that law broken because it's being enforced just however, you know, whoever's in power makes that law be what it is. Um, you know, they're not going to consider it like he's a lawbreaker right. or she. Right. And, and, you know, laws are always malleable, right? Laws can change. So something that was legal five years ago can become illegal tomorrow. And so, so it becomes very uh, fluid as far as what is acceptable. And I think that, that this is where morality comes into uh, play. I think it's important to question those laws that people might consider immoral or unethical. And, and they can ask and question that, and they should question those things. 
Um, just a simple example is the, the freedom of speech restrictions in any country. So whether either we accept freedom of speech or we do not accept freedom of speech, but we can't have it both ways. And I think that this selective approach to free speech is some people are penalized for speaking their mind. Other, people's aren't, uh, other people aren't uh, penalized for speaking their mind. This becomes a, a, a question of then do we as, as artists or as, as people on the dissident right or what have you, um, are we becoming outlaws in a sense, outlaw heroes to at least those that uh, follow us? And that, that becomes, that opens up this question of what is permissible, what isn't permissible. Obviously, and you made a really good point, I think, with Robin Hood. I mean, if he stole from someone and somebody resisted and someone got killed, then, you know, the hero can become very quickly a villain. Um, Handsome Horse, what about you? What do you think about this? Well, I just wanted to jump in and say, look, it's a, you, you're asking if the uh, the dissident right is an outlaw, you know, or we outlaw heroes or an outlaw organization. We're dissidents. The dissidents are what? Dissidents are, are outside of the political mm -hmm. system. We're not just we're not we're not an op we're not you know we're not the uh, the opposition party. Right. We're not an opposition party. We're outside of the system. Mm -hmm. So are we outlaws? Uh, figuratively, at least, yes. I mean, even if we're not breaking any literal laws, we are. We, the law is designed to be against what we are and what we do because exactly. we're dissidents. Yep. It's not a. I mean, I mean, look. I mean, we can all be like we could. We could all have a, a, a normie facing front, and and be you know square middle class presenting normal people, but we are appreciate that we're dissidents. And there's not a real way around that. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I'm sorry. But to, to answer your question, is Robin Hood a hero or a villain? I, yeah, look, the story. Look, the story is he's a hero. Right. That's the story. Uh, you know, I mean, supposed to 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 backfill and to turn him into a hero. Uh, it's. Uh, I, mean, I suppose it's you know it's easy to just uh, figure out that this was this was feudal this was feudal uh, England. And uh, the it wasn't capitalism. So anybody, any, any, all, anybody who had property, all of the property realistically belonged to the king. And it was a system of taxes being paid by, you know, the peasantry into the aristocracy. And in the, uh, the Robin Hood story, right, uh, uh, King Richard, King Richard the Lionheart was off on one of the crusades. And he'd left the place in, char in the charge of the sheriff of Nottingham, who was, uh, who was corrupt I forget how he was corrupt, but I have the idea that he was a tyrant, and I'm sure he took, you know, he overtaxed the people. And so stealing from him was basically just getting your money back. Right. You know, if, if taxation is theft, then um, Robin Hood stealing from, from the Sheriff of Nottingham and his lackeys isn't theft at all. It is just uh, libertarianism. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, I'm sure somebody's going to scream about the non-aggression principle in the chat, but I think we're smarter than that. Um, but the idea is no. Is it? Is it no? He's a he was a hero. He was a hero. He was a hero. It's. Uh, I mean, it's it's easy as it's easy. It's kind of as easy as that because you've got an illegitimate authority and the corruption of those uh, of the aristocratic uh, cronies of the sheriff. And so, right, Robin. I I don't remember if Robin actually deposes the sheriff of Nottingham, but the idea is that he basically is take keeping care of. Uh, King Richard's subjects until King Richard ke returned. Right. Well, he's, so he's, he's, he's the ideal reactionary hero, if you think about it. I think he's less of a, of a, uh, a libertarian hero than he is a reactionary hero because he recognizes the, illegal, you know, the, uh, the illegal actions of, the, of, uh, of Prince John and the Sheriff of Nottingham, and he basically is fighting against that, but he's not looking to create a new social order. That's right. He's not looking to create a new social order. He's, uh, I mean, he's outside of the social order, I suppose, in a sense. But he's not really. Mm -hmm. He's folk hero, or at least I don't. I don't get that sense. You know, I didn't get the yeah. sense that it wasn't like the, uh, the. It wasn't like the peasantry and the blacksmiths. He had bunch. He had a whole crew, right? The Merry Men. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but if even if you looked at uh, other heroes like Rob Roy, could also be considered a uh, an outlaw hero or. Or any one of these uh, national folk heroes, you know, because sure. they were all forced into uh, becoming outlaws. 
So, so even kings have at one point had to live an outlaw life, if you think about it. Um, so when, when someone's legitimacy, someone's position is put into question and they're forced to defend that position, then the prevailing order, the dominant order that's trying to impose itself on that society, um, if you're fighting against that, then to that imposing power, you're an outlaw. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you are an outlaw in the traditional sense. So I think that it all I depends. agree. And actually, I'm sorry, let me interrupt because because heck of Gab thought of it in the chat. I think moments as as uh, moments after I was thinking, why haven't we mentioned Braveheart yet? Right. He, he, he he's mentioning William Wallace. And I think that's actually a perfect, you know, sort of nationalist, national outlaw hero. Absolutely is. Yeah. And I and I did want to mention William Wallace. I also wanted to mention Rob Roy. There's a number of yeah. uh, of, of outlaw heroes like this. And and these are uh, nationalist heroes. These are heroes that are representing their people. They're representing their nation. And, and what they're saying is that we want independence, freedom for our nation. And so they're not trying to impose any kind of uh, ideological view from them, for their, for them, from their point of view. They're just looking to restore the old order. And at least for most of the case, you would, you would find that. And the old order being essentially the independence of that nation or the, uh, uh, the, the old king in, in the case of Robin Hood or the uh, independence of Scotland and before the uh, English uh, um, conquered the Scots. So I think that, that yes. you have all of these different uh, um, elements that are important and extremely uh, relevant to us today, I think, that when we're looking at all these different characters throughout history, all these different outlaw heroes, I think many different... Outlaw heroes have uh, different layers to, to review, so not all of them are the same. Um, I don't think that Billy the Kid is of the same caliber as William Wallace, for example. You can't compare the two of them. But both of them are, in a sense, uh, outlaw heroes. Now, I read somewhere, I think, that he was fighting against the cartel. I have to look into that myself. I'm very curious to see what Billy the Kid's real story is, because that sounded very interesting in the chat I read that before. Um, so, so I find that very fascinating. Um, in either case, um, so do you, let me just uh, go back to the questions because now I got lost in the, uh, in the chats a little bit. Um, so in a sense, then that answers the next, que next question is whether outlaw heroes truly exist or is it just a mythological trope? And how do you react if we had outlaw heroes like this today? So I think that would be the next question on this one. And I think that a lot of what we've discussed already sort of touched upon this. But um, Handsome Horse, if you could just uh, give your thoughts on that, I'd appreciate it. Well, I think we have examples from history of outlaw heroes that did actually exist. Right. Uh, whether they can exist now, whether they can – I don't know if any of them have had to overcome liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. So – uh, I think it, it becomes harder because your outlaw heroes are, are, are not going to have – you're not going to hear about them. I don't feel like we're going to hear about them because the media is controlled. Social media is uh, you know, fairly – is very narrow and not necessarily connected to real life. And we're not – I just don't think that's going to happen. Or like, I don't think that's going to – that's the sort of thing we're going to find – in the U.S. in any sort of grand scale or any sort of scale that uh, is going to, um, I guess, uh, be durable. So, for example, I mean, there's always every once in a while, there's always a hero or what have you that, that pops up in social media who's somebody who's based somebody, you know, somebody who uh, so something something happens and somebody, uh, you know, and, so, and somebody goes viral because of something they did that is uh, that is really impressive. And what happens? Those people get destroyed. They get destroyed fast. And it's uh, – are they a folk hero? Well, it'd be great if they were a folk hero, but they're not. They're, they're, they, they're, they go viral all over Twitter. Maybe they even hit the news. Journalists uh, get a hold of it and start asking their employer. They get fired. Uh, their wife leaves them. And, um, you know, that's the end of it. You never hear from them again. Right. They become uh, tragic stories, essentially. And, and what I find and, and that's that's actually a really good point that in a liberal democracy, the one at least that we live in today um, and in liberalism in general, 
can you become a hero against the system? And I think that's that's uh, a very important question. Yes, I think the quick the short answer is yes, but but I think the effect is, the effectiveness of it is definitely more difficult today than ever before. Although I have to say that the you know the powers that be manufacture these outlaw heroes, and they are manufacturing these these thugs, and they're trying to turn thugs into outlaw heroes. And I think Absolutely. That, that's a very dangerous thing that's going on. So what we're seeing right now is actually the inverse of what we should be seeing. And what we're seeing is a system that's manufacturing its own outlaws and its own outlaw heroes for the sake of taking that whole um, mythology away from us so that we can't contextualize our own outlaw heroes. At least that's how I'm seeing it now. And I, I think that's absolutely right. Because, look, there's, there's the euphemism uh, civil disobedience, which is, uh, you know, which really just means some variety of an illegal protest. And then you've got another euphemism, which is peaceful protest, which usually means uh, some sort of riot or violent insurrection. Right. So and these are those are those are AP style guide terms for whatever is, I guess, whatever is anti-white, honestly. Right. right. So. Uh, so you're right. I'm just. Uh, I guess I'm just plus wanting you, what you said. Yeah, and and we become the villains of this story, at least in their eyes, not in our eyes, obviously. But but in their eyes, we become the villains, and and so so they're pushing this message of of making us collectively villains, so that any one of us that dare raise our voices in resistance to this becomes a a symbol of this villainy that they're trying to impose. And when, in fact, it's really nothing more than just a manufactured control op. Yes, agree. And so we now are in a position, I think, that... And this is interesting. So, Fornal, did you want to add anything to this, by the way? I didn't want to... Um, no, I mean, I think there are hero, uh, outlaw heroes. I think they're real. And we've had many... Um, and yeah, we don't get to hear about a lot of these people, or they're made out to be the worst demons that ever existed. Um, so, yeah, I think they're there. And and you know, there's we occasionally. Well, I don't think anymore. I don't think anymore a mainstream would uh, sing praise of any uh, true hero. You know, it's going to be an anti-white doing something that's destructive to our, our culture or heritage that's that's their heroes now so i've there are arch villains <laughs> right, right um it's very interesting yeah. though that that you know are we are we really you know doing all of our art and all of these uh um uh let's just say emphasizing our heroes so for for posterity so that in 50 years our descendants can look back and say, well, at least there was a group that, that did mention this. And, you know, that that sort of reignites the spirit, if you if you will. Um, so so I don't know. I don't know what the the ultimate effect is going to be. I see I see that a lot of people, a lot of uh, people who should not really be celebrating these these uh, villains as heroes are celebrating them as heroes because they're just simply uh, uh led astray and and they they totally drank the kool-aid on this and they don't even want to discuss it anymore like and these these are people these are our people so that's a very difficult part to uh to embrace but i think that no matter what i think we we still as artists i think we should always try to accentuate our heroes wherever possible even in our contemporary uh uh society if we have i think the sky king uh, a ballad is 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 an exceptional, and the meme is an exceptional example of someone who who was in a way a very tragic hero in a sense. Uh, absolutely, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of this uh, this is this isn't really. I think this is, this is thematically related, but honestly, all of this this whole system is based on the premise of white guilt, and. 
Right. So, I mean, I, I've been listening to some Jason Coney lately, and I think I am really buying into his idea that uh, this phrase, no white guilt, is the, the sort of magic words to dispel all of this. Because once you pull out that Jenga piece out of the, uh, you know, out of the tower, mm -hmm. you really have no, you have no, you have no responsibility to feel to, you know, that to put uh, your, your adversary on, give them the moral authority. And, and really, that's what's happened, right? Like all of this thing, all of these things that you've talked about, these people who have drunk the Kool-Aid, mm -hmm. the Kool-Aid they drunk was actually accepting that, oh, no, no, something, there, there was a wrong that happened. And somehow... I personally am responsible for it, right. and there's something that I can do to to uh, to redeem myself, but also help help you. And there's no there's no helping, there's no there's no helping, and there's no redemption, and that's just not that's not in the cards. And so once you pull out the once you pull out that that white guilt um, part, there's there's really nothing else to it. And I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that everything's going to fall apart like uh, a final boss in a uh, video game or a uh, a movie. But as far as it goes, as far as talking to amenable people, people who otherwise can be persuaded, you know, normie people who probably have you know drunk the uh, drunk the Kool Aid, so to speak, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, and and are otherwise square with the author moral authority of today. If you can get any traction with, uh, you know, white guilt or this feeling of personal guilt for something might have happened in the past and take that away, I think that's, uh, that's a really that's a, that's the way to go. And that's where, like, once we have that, you know, then you can have folk heroes again. Then you can have outlaw heroes. Right. Then you can have heroes again. Right. Right. And and you know is what is that Bonnie Tyler song? I need a hero, right? I think that's the. Uh... Oh yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, I I fully I fully agree with you, and I think that that confidence, an unapologetic approach to who you are, is the first step. Confidence and and conviction, saying that you know this is who I am, this is what I stand for, and then again you know we, sort of maybe you do need to be somewhat of a chivalric hero before you can embrace the outlaw hero, if that makes sense. Well, I think you need the discipline, at least. Yeah, yeah. And I think they both uh, tie together. I mean, maybe the chivalric hero today is the outlaw hero. Maybe that's, what, that's the way we have to look at it. So um, do you, either one of you gentlemen have any additional comments you would like to add to uh, anything that uh, I discussed or anything that, uh, that we discussed in, the, uh, in our discussion or any comments in the comment section i'm just checking i just don't want to miss anything let's see here um did i you think guys... i'm good yeah for no yeah no i'm good all right and that was yeah that was very interesting I, I i enjoyed this all right so let me let me go to the next question then and then we'll uh slowly wrap up the conversation oh i thought we were done <laughs> no well no almost... you don't get to leave yet <laughs> <laughs> but I need another beer. No. <laughs> well, you can okay, get another beer quick. You okay. can get a beer and then you can come right back. Um, so, so handsome horse, would you like to read any of your songs? I mean, I think that's really what I wanted to hear all night long, to be honest with you, all jokes aside, I really wanted to hear you recite your songs. <laughs> okay. Which, which, uh, what, what do people want to hear first? Well, is there anything, uh, Let's try. Look, did they close the window? Let's see. If, I think uh, I might have closed my window. Here we go. All right. Well, let's, oh, let's see. Let's see if there's. In the meantime, I think. Uh, let's see. Ah, the mamas and the peppies poetry. Yes. Okay, they say so, poetry. All right. Okay. We're going to start with. Okay. We're going to surprise us. Yep. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> we're going to start. Okay. We're going to start. Oh, let's start with something good here. Start strong. Diversity is our strength. Diversity is our strength. We will go to any length to live in harmony. We will ignore crime statistics because it is much more realistic to pretend that we're all one family. Diversity is our strength. We will go to any length. We will lower every bar. Although average IQ rates don't always dictate fate, they will take you pretty far. Diversity is our strength. We will go to any length to tear down our history. No culture, no tradition, 
because we are on a mission of civilizational degeneracy. Diversity is our strength. We will go to any length and be called Nazis anyway. Stereotypes are true, and they're there for me and you to make sense of the world every day. Diversity is our strength. We will go to any length to make sure that you agree. The march for civil rights will continue after whites succumb to demographic destiny. I'm going to clap for myself. Yay! Did you get your beer for Noel? Thank you. I did. Nice. So, so, uh, wow. You know, it, it's, it's so cool to hear you recite the poem as a, or just read it as opposed to singing yeah. it. It's, it's really, it, I'm, I'm very impressed with it. And it, um, so I'm getting a lot of, wow, look at all the positive feedback from everyone in the group. Nice. And it does. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, let's see what it, Hyra said. It's crazy how different it is. The tone changed like that. Hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. And Luke Mason says black pill, which is pretty funny. (laughs) No, but see, it's funny. It's like, well, look, if you put it to a a silly little melody, uh, it's cute and funny. Right. Right. Yep. Uh, But the words are still there. And, mm -hmm. you know, and and I. Right. Yeah. It's it's well, it's kind of funny because the the melody typically uh, melody and words are uh, come at the same time. Mm-hmm. Because realistically, if it doesn't have a melody, it's not really music. So, right. uh, but yeah, it's the juxtapositions that I think, I don't know why we get banned everywhere we go. I don't understand it either. It's sad. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, <laughs> well, here, here we go. Okay. Tax farm blues. All right. Let's go for the next one. We're livestock on a tax farm, plowing revenue for the state, doing time in adult daycare. Sometimes someone brings cake. Protected from ourselves by social services, paid in fiat currency, the tax man knows is his. Someday it might dawn on you that you're not really free if you're not lulled by creature comforts and degeneracy. We're livestock on a tax farm. Funding government gives me dat. And multi-million dollar studies on why lesbians are fat. Hiding in the crime statistics collected by the FBI is a brutal dose of reality that cannot be denied. You know the Constitution is just words on a page, and Globo Homo Corporations help you line your cage. We're livestock on a tax farm, the best there's ever been. American history is just a list of white man's sins. We send troops to Afghanistan, but the threat is here at home. Deep State Silicon Valley cartel has mapped your whole genome. Someday we might wake up and notice we're not truly free. In the meantime, we have creature comfort and degeneracy. Wow. <laughs> oh, this oh, is, you. this is, this thank is, you, real. I, it, it does. It has such a different, different kind of uh, uh, meaning to it when you're reading it like this. It's, I mean, and, and, <laughs> wow. It, it's so I mean, I, and I love the songs. It's not that, I mean, the, you know, the, the, the songs, the music, everything is just perfect. But when you're reading it like this, it just changes it so much. Um, look at that. Look at all the positive reactions. Oh, yeah, look at that. People like poetry. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, also, I mean, these aren't, these aren't really, I, I, let's put it this way. I mean, these aren't, these are, these are, these are brainy poems. They're not really, um, how do I put it? Like they're they're not they're not they're not um what do you call it? Uh, they're, well, they're not that brainy, but they're they're not emotional. Like right. they're not they're not love songs. Not love songs. That's correct. They're not no. they're not. Uh, you know, here we go. Well, hold on. Since we're on a roll here, I guess everybody's up. Are we still how we're doing? We're oh. not losing people. No, no, we're we're good. Here we're we good. go. Mm-hmm. All right, chilling effect. Get comfy, fam. We got a new groove. Life is easy when your thoughts are approved. Your pills were red before they turned black. Put that behind you because it's time to kick back and feel the cha-cha-cha-cha-cha-cha-cha chilling effect. We used to have a country, but we gave it away. Global homo came and moved in to stay. Get fresh online and they'll see you in court. You used to have a future, but they made you abort. It's the chilling effect. Better watch what you say and what you hear. Better watch what you say. Be nice. Toodle-oo. 
Better watch what you say and stay in fear. No matter what you do, your skin is a gang tattoo. Huh. You'll feel the chilling effect. Everywhere, it's going to be the current year in the land of the free. If you're rude, the bank will freeze your account because that's what the Constitution's about. Feel the chilling effect. Wow. All right. Wow. Okay, I got one. Can I do one? Oh, yeah, please, please. By please. all means, by all means, yeah. <coughs> all right. Okay, so this is the lyrics to... March of the Tit or March of Titans. Perfect. It's kind of related. So, okay, here we go. History is written by the winner, a game to be the rulers over all, to bring about a kingdom of the center, to lay the guild on us until we fall. Schools teaching us that we were wrong, never learned about our glory true. All of our, our good deeds without a song, with slander sung by every you know who. We march like the Titans. You hear their thunder echo through time. We march with the Titans. We know their story. We have their mind. History is sold by the liar, so toss their mind control to the fire. The truth is written plain in our spirit. Just open up your mind and you can hear it. Take a look and see for yourself. Pull a random book off of the shelf. Try to find the words about our glory. Find the lies that tell a different story. We march like the Titans. You hear their e e thunder echo through time. We march with the Titans. We know their story. We have their mind. Wow. Thank you. No, <laughs> no I, 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 I got one more. Go ahead. Yeah. Please, please. Yes. See if you can recognize this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm free. I'm free. And freedom tastes of reality. I'm free. I'm free. And I'm waiting for you to follow me. If I told you what it takes to reach the highest high, you'd laugh and say nothing's that simple. But you've been told many times before, messiahs pointed to the door, and no one had the guts to leave the temple. I'm free. I'm free. And freedom tastes of reality. I'm free. I'm free. And I'm waiting for you to follow me. Guys, this is. This I'm going to so cover cool. that. I'm going to cover that awesome. song. <laughs> no, this is, this is so. Me. This is so cool. I, you know, and and it just show, it just goes to show you how how the musicians are just as poetic. You know, I mean, there's no. It, it might be some difference in in rhythm and and rhyme and and how it's structured, but essentially it's the same thing. And guys, this is like such a gift. I I, I can't even begin to tell you that. Now, all of a sudden, we're going to have a bunch of new poets. Oh, well, they're, they're all around, man. Yeah. Uh, or, or at least, right, it's, uh, I guess there you go, right? They're, the, all these song lyrics are, I suppose, right, if you, if, you, if you gussy them up and you act the part, they're poets, they're poems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. it makes <clears throat> it very interesting. So, um, so I just wanted to check. Do you guys want? Do you have any other uh, anything else you'd like to share? Because by all you know, we still have people here. So you know, you're, and I can see everyone's still very interested. Um, what about right, here we... what about the oh, bugs? Go ahead, sorry. The bugs. Sure. Welcome to the occupation. Time to eat the bugs. Ritual humiliation. Numb it up with drugs. Until you get the hang of the new rules. Time to eat the bugs. Welcome to the new inversion. Your culture is obsolete. Addicted to a new perversion, you are what you eat. Soon you'll get the hang of the new rules. Time to eat the bugs. Welcome to the occupation. Time to eat the bugs. Mandatory chemical castration in the name of love. Soon you'll get the hang of the new rules. Time to eat the bugs. Uh, wow there you go wow <laughs> i was like so speechless i'm like oh this is this is like really sad <laughs> these are yeah these are yeah these are actually pretty dark I, yeah. you know if you read them that way they're pretty dark but uh, well they say that you know all the chips and all a bunch of food it has tons of bug parts because of the factory so we're in a way already eating the bugs 
That is true. That yeah. is true, right? That if you look at the the, the FDA has um right, there's permissible parts per million, yeah. like bug it's parts per in, in grain and stuff. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it is pretty gross. Oh, so Mama P says our earlier stuff is even darker, I think. Hmm. Huh. I wonder what she means. Well, is there anyone in particular? Let's see. Uh... Let's see. Well, let me see. Let me go to her. Oh, let's... oh, you know what? We have a website, so I can actually go to <laughs> and see what I'm trying to read something with a party song. So we say. Oh, I love this. I wonder this what she great. means. I wonder what she might mean. Uh, you got to go back. Right wing. Oh, uh, well, uh, let's see. Okay, wait, wait. This might be fun. Okay. Degeneracy. You want to read? You want to hear degeneracy? Yes, please. Okay. I don't want your degeneracy anywhere near me. Your loud and proud promiscuity. Congratulations on your STD. Gonorrhea, syphilis, HPV, herpes, rectal cancer, HIV. I don't want your degeneracy anywhere near me. Open borders and open legs, career girls with frozen eggs, trying to find a man when they're way too old, can't even be saved by thought patrol. I don't want your degeneracy anywhere near me. Dirty hippies rioting in the street, greasy dreadlocks that smell like feet. Childless politicians let the violence spread because the global elite wants your nation dead. I don't want your degeneracy anywhere near me. I don't want your degeneracy anywhere near me boom <laughs> boom <laughs> this is this all is right. gold gentlemen for Noel, we're going to try to push you for one more me yeah me for Noel, or is there another for no oh, no okay. you for no that one you <laughs> okay uh i got one i could do let me find it here is this uh no not that one i'll get in trouble for that one uh I, I have one. I have one. I swear. Just give me one second. I'm looking for it. It's called uh, oh, With Conscience. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Since we're being, you know, dark. And this actually has the word dark in it, so it goes along. Okay. Echoes in the dark. Danger to us all. Pray upon the dim and weak. Heeding evil's call. Lack of empathy shallow cold and fake no responsibility or guilt for goodness sake looking deep i see the man the dishonor and deceit like the child only your needs who is in the driver's seat we'd be pleased to meet you if there was someone living inside could it be you never had a soul just a demon going for a ride at the seat of power danger to us all Lie and cheat to get your way. Heed the madman's call. Climb the wicked tower. Grab and steal and take. No responsibility. Your every care is fake. <laughs> I'm running out of breath. I, I think you're there. <laughs> I see that gleam. You wouldn't dare. You wouldn't dream. Feel one time. Someone, not you. Too weak to face the justice that's due. Fool me. Me feed the beast yearning to grow. Cast your victims to the pit burning below. I think you're there. I see that gleam. You wouldn't dare. You wouldn't dream. Feel one, one time someone not you. Too weak to face the justice that's due. Yeah, that's about psychopaths. Who are in power. <laughs> this was... Very nice. I, it it really it it gives the whole. I mean, now people are going to probably try to look up all these songs, and and they're going to compare what they heard here with the song, and it's going to give them a different perspective on it. I think, and I think it helps in a way. It gives them, uh, again, with the music, and and I think for Null, a lot of your music though is also very consistent with the theme or the message of the of the lyrics, though, right? Yeah, it's kind of been the genre i've been you know been interested in forever in making i just like you know big over dramatic doom or or that neo folk stuff i just it's fun to make it yeah and i think from uh, now on every time i have a musician on i'm gonna ask them to recite their own songs <laughs> well wait i should have, <laughs> i shouldn't have said that because now they won't come on <laughs> but all it's, it's easier to it's easier to read the words than it is to actually sing them and play them 
Well, so I think they should, yeah. you know, I think they should be okay with it. Yeah, I, I, I almost start singing mine. It's like I have to kind of <laughs> stop because, like, you wouldn't dare, you know. I should, <laughs> that's right. the only way I've ever done it. The, now let me ask. Yes, yeah, see, look, 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 uh, Nolas, you're going to have Luke Mason on soon, right? He's 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 down. Oh, he'll do you, it. You better believe it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's he's going to be on my show, and we've been recording it. He's doing all these, you know, voice acting and stuff. It. Mm-hmm. You guys are going to – it is hilarious. I mean he, he is a great voice actor. He must have had acting lessons or something because <laughs> they're, they are awesome, all his lines. Well, he's – I mean yes. Luke Mason also has written poetry. He's shared some poetry with me and I've always – you know, um, but I, I need to have him – Luke, if you're listening, please send me your poetry so I can, uh, I can either play it or you could just read it yourself. That would be the best. If you read it yourself, and then I can play it on on any one of these shows. So by all means, and this goes out to everyone else, if you have poetry you'd like to read yourself, just get in touch with me. Uh, contact me with uh, on on Facebook, on Twitter, on uh, Gab. You could just send me a message, and um, you can also go on my site. It's uh, www abnormacracy. I can't even pronounce it myself. Abnormacracy dot com. And you can then send me an email over there. Um, so all submissions are welcome. Ideally, I would like to have some, you know, someone read their own poetry. But I'm also just like Barovius uh, writes poems and he asks me to recite them or read them. I, I'll do that as well. So, so this goes out to everyone. But Luke, in particular, please uh, send me some stuff so, so I can either play it on any one of the shows in the, in the uh future and definitely want to have you on um so gentlemen is there anything else that you would like to uh add read comment anything else that uh might be interesting uh sure i guess uh well are we good we'd uh well hold on it's 10 o'clock on a school night right on the east coast here um but uh let's say Oh, okay, here we go. Here we go. Let's let's, let's 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 do one more. Okay, hate crime hoax. Here we go. <laughs> <clears throat> Some cultures are better than others. Some fish just can't swim in the same tank. Some folks have a high time preference and feel compelled to just grab the cash and run. So if you're feeling down, or just got woke, go and throw a hate crime hoax. Hate crime hoax. The media loves you the most. Because it's all the white man's fault, have yourself a hate crime hoax. Sometimes there's not, sometimes there's just not enough oppression. Tom Wolf had this hustle figured out. Diversity is just another grift. Cold hard cash is what it's all about. So if you want the cash, but won't do honest work, go and throw a hate crime hoax. Hate crime hoax. They pay blacks and Jews and Muslims the most. So if you need your race hate subsidized, have yourself a hate crime hoax. Woo! Wow. Nice. Wow. All right. So, gentlemen, I think we're going to wrap it up now. Um, Fernal, would you do you have anything else or? or... No, okay. I'm good. And, and thank you. Oh, no, thank you very much. And do you uh, do you guys have any last thoughts that you would like to add or share with the audience? Well, thanks for having us. Thank you. Yes. This was a really good conversation. I, I had a really good time with both of you. And so before we end this episode, uh, please tell the audience where they may find you and your work. Uh, for Null? Uh You could find my stuff on Bandcamp. Uh, I just look up For Null, F-O-R-N-U-L-L. That's just one word. And uh, I make videos there on BitChute and YouTube. You can at least for now. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how. But uh, I have a pretty small audience, so I think I can get away with stuff. But find me there and on Twitter, for Noel USA. Thank you very much. And uh, Handsome Horse? Nice. Well, Mama's Peppies is not on YouTube because we got kicked off. We're not on uh, uh, Instagram because we got kicked off. Uh, we're not on Facebook because we got kicked off. But we are on BitChute. Mama's Peppies on BitChute. And we've got uh, a website, mamaspepes.com, 
Mama's uh, Mama P runs the uh, Twitter account, which is at Mama's Pepe's. She runs the Gab. Uh, the oh, we're also banned on Gab cam- on Bandcamp. She tells me mm-hmm. uh, that's true. We're not on Bandcamp. We are. You can purchase our stuff at White Art Collective, and you can listen to it and poke around at uh, Mama's Pepe's dot com. And I am uh, I am at at Diomedes at Gab. Thank you, you very much. Me, Thank you very much, guys. And um, I had a wonderful time speaking with both of you. Thank you again for sharing your time and your thoughts. And thank you all for granting me your time and patience. It is through art that we can achieve the highest standards of decorum and elegance. It is through art that we can move our brothers and sisters to finally awaken. It is through art that we can seek the face of God. I hope all of you and your families stay safe during these precarious times. Focus on what matters. Our people have been through worse, and we will always rise again. Our strength lies in our ability to love and respect each other. Our strength is defined by our ability to set aside our differences and fight alongside each other as sons and daughters of Europa. I will end this episode with a powerful song by Traversing the Divide titled The Journey Home. No matter where our journey takes us, let us always find our way back home. You can find Traversing the Divide's music on his YouTube channel. Please like and support both Jack White, Traversing the Divide, Fournal, Handsome Horse, and all the great artists from the White Art Collective. Have a good evening, everyone.